So with that, our first speaker is uh, Brad Pierce, and he's going to come down. And uh, as you know, because I wanted to make this oral presentation, um, we were a bit selective in the people we went, who, who I uh, asked to give talks on. Um, and so I want to tell you a little bit before they get talking about why they were picked. Um, so one of the things I wanted to do with this symposium is to uh, talk about new things that are happening uh, that we probably don't know about. Uh, Brad, in particular, has been involved a lot with air quality. I think this is potentially a good direction to go for Sims, and if we do, Brad will be one of those leaders. And more importantly, he just got involved with this new research program, new satellite mission called Tempo. Um, and so I asked Brad uh, to give us an overview of what the heck that's all about, because I know very little as well. So. Thanks, Steve. And uh, Steve, no, there's no audio. That's right. So Steve chose the title, and I thought I'd go with that. So uh, we have Ringo down in the corner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, Tempo, no, 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 can you guys see okay, or should we no, give them the lights? Give them the lights. Give them in the front. Give them in the front. How do we do that? <laughs> well, it probably says dim. Oh, right oh, here we go. How do we give them the lights? Okay, so Tempo is uh, the Troposphere Commission's. Uh, monitoring of pollution, and uh, I'm on the science team of that uh, as a as a, a theory modeler person. And uh, the the PI for this is Kelly Chance, who's at the Harvard uh, uh, Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory. So Tempo is um, part of the recent a new program in NASA called the NASA Earth Venture Instrument Program. And it's basically trying to identify small science uh, instrument investigations that can complement the much larger programs like EOS that, uh, that everyone's familiar with. And TEMPO is actually the first uh, instrument selected under this um, Earth Venture program. And it's a short, it's a, it's a relatively small budget, it's $90 million total. It's quick, uh, the instrument has to be built uh, by 2007. And then the anticipated launch is, is uh, 2017. Anticipated launch is 2019. Uh, Tempo, uh, unlike a lot of the work that's done here uh, in hyperspectral IR, Tempo is a hyperspectral UV vis instrument, um, and it's using UV vis uh, wavelengths so that it can do tropospheric air quality uh, retrieval. In particular, it will retrieve ozone, uh, nitrogen dioxide. And nitrogen dioxide controls much of the tropospheric ozone formation, so those two together are critical. Uh, sulfur dioxide, which is uh, a precursor to sulfate aerosols, again, very important for air quality. Uh, formaldehyde and glaxol, uh, which are indicators of, of, of volatile organic compounds in the atmosphere. Uh, and then water vapor, aerosols, cloud, and UVB radiation. And the the TEMPO uh, fits into the overall NASA program in that it provides a lot of the capabilities that were recommended in the decadal survey. Um, in particular, it addresses some of the uh, recommendations for GeoCape. And I'll talk about that a little bit more towards the end of the talk. And uh, the, the launch of 2019 is critical because this puts this instrument up at the same time uh, that both Europe and uh, Korea are putting up similar instruments and allows us to have a, a geoconstellation to, to do air quality measurements. So <clears throat> the UV vis spectrometers, there's a long heritage of these in, in uh, LEO orbit, uh, beginning with GOM in 1995, the Skiamaki, uh, OMI is some that probably people are familiar with, and then GOM uh, 2, which is up now. Uh, and then UMPS that was recently launched uh, on SUMI and PP. <clears throat> However, these, these polar orbiters were designed primarily for stratospheric ozone and, and N2O retrievals, and so their, uh, their ground pixel size is quite coarse. You can see that they're uh, 40 by 320 for the early GOM, and uh, OMI is around 15 by 30 at the highest resolution. So what this is going to, what Tempo is going to give us is this sort of measurement capability except in, in geostationary orbit. Uh, 
Um, this is showing the, uh, the greater North America, GNA, uh, um, field of regard that it will have. Uh, and it's been chosen very, very specifically for, for this domain so that you can capture both the uh, uh, Mexico City to the southern part of the domain, all of the continental U.S., and then also Canada. And I'll talk a little bit later on about why Canada is particularly interesting uh, in terms of changing emissions um, of some of these air quality uh, precursor gases. Uh, in the same way that you've heard about the advantages of of a geo hyperspectral IR sounder. Uh, this hyperspectral UV sounder offers many of the same advantages. Uh, the pixel size is going to be two by four and a half kilometers, uh, which to put that in perspective is 350 times uh, the resolution of GOM2 and 50 times the, the OMI uh, spatial resolution, and actually larger than the UMP, or an high, an even higher resolution relative to UMPs. And what this means is you'll be able to make uh, measurements of uh, these precursor, precursor gases at an urban scale. And that's critical because some of these are very localized. And this is just a schematic showing uh, the GOM2 footprint over uh, Washington, D.C. area, the OMI footprint, and now what Tempo is going to get us. We'll actually be able to map uh, urban scale pollution. Uh, so this is a little bit more information about the key characteristics. Uh, again, I talked about the field regard. It's going to do hourly imagery, um, two, and a half, uh, two by four and a half kilometer footprint. Uh, the spectral range goes from the UV out into uh, the visible, uh, which is interesting because there'll be overlaps with the uh, GOZAR API instrument for two of the visible bands. Uh, spectral resolution is 0.6 nanometers. Um, and then this figure down, the table down below kind of just shows the various uh, wavelength bands uh, that are critical for the various species that are going to be retrieved, and also the, uh, the, the, the margin of error uh, in terms of signal to noise uh, versus what's predicted and what's required. Um, the instrument <clears throat> has relatively low uh, mass and power, and that again is critical because this is going to be hosted on a, on a commercial uh, communication set satellite. Um, so that low resource requirement uh, allows us to start engaging um, other means of getting these things in geostationary orbit, which is a very expensive part of the whole effort. So this is showing the optical depths for the some of the, the species going to be measured by tempo. This is log base 10 of optical depth, and various species are here. And you can see what's driving the, uh, the measurement requirements are the formaldehyde, which are the green and the glyoxal measurements, which are the blue, and those are the ones that are down uh, at the, the lowest uh, optical depths. But uh, optical depths for ozone and for N2O, which I think are some of the primary uh, uh, measurements that will be made by, by uh, TEMPO, are, are quite adequate. So uh, most people here are not air quality people, and so I have a little bit uh, to talk about to try and put air quality measurements from space in perspective. So, this is a composite <coughs> image that was assembled from uh, the day-night band from VIRS. I think a lot of you have seen this. Uh, this is for April through October of 2012. And what we can see is we can see all the city lights, and we can even see some roads and little towns in between the big cities. And, and these are very useful uh, uh, images, and, and people are exploring what to do with these images now that they're up on, on VIRS. Uh, but what's this image? Anyone have a guess on what that image might be? Or less. That's the 1999 emission inventory for carbon monoxide. And the NO2 emissions look very similar. And again, it's NO2 emissions that are driving ozone photochemistry in the troposphere. And you can see that they're very closely tied to these light sources. And that's because the energy, the emissions are associated with, with combustion. So this is the kind of scale that we need to understand these uh, emissions on. And if we go a little bit further, we can say what's missing in this. This is a model inventory database. Anyone, if we can look quickly, anyone see something that might be missing? Aha. So the natural gas flares from oil production uh, associated with the shale formation in 
North Dakota. And so that's something that in the 1999 mission inventory, that stuff wasn't even occurring. And so it's not representative in the modeling framework that people are using now to understand air quality. But in fact, it's there. And being able to observe these uh, trace gases from space allows us to start understanding those emission inventories. So again, a way to tie some of the beers measurements uh, with this, this tempo measurement. So going a little bit further, what, why do we need to have uh, geostationary measurements at high spectral and spatial resolution to try and understand these trends in N2O? Uh, so, or N2O. So this is a, a, a slide uh, from a paper uh, by McLadden um, in ACP, or actually in, G, in uh, GRL. And this is looking, using the OMI satellite, the OMI instrument, uh, to try and look at trends in uh, Canadian in NO2 emissions over the Canadian oil sands, which are a bit further north. Uh, and this figure, so again, we've got a map showing uh, the continental U.S. and the NO2 distribution um, averaged over uh, a long period of time. And then kind of a zooming in to see what sort of information we can see just within this Canadian oil sands region. And what you see is a very, very fuzzy image. So these, um, these sources, the overall sands areas on the order of 120 kilometers. What we can get from OMI because we've got a long record is changes. So between 2005 and 2010, there's the mean. If we look at 2005 to 2007, then on two emissions are uh, relatively low. And we can see that between 2008 and 2010, they've increased significantly. So that's what's being done currently. What, what Temple is going to provide is the ability to look at this now at a spatial scale that, that's unprecedented and be able to really drill down and understand uh, what the magnitude of these emissions are. And again, having a fuzzy view of NO2 emissions uh, doesn't, it, its impact on photochemistry is strongly alias because uh, you're spreading these concentrations out. Photochemistry is different under high concentrations than low concentrations. So Temple will capture spatial structure NO2 emissions uh, that have not been available from the correct Leo observations. So, what else will Temple do? Again, it's geostationary, and I, I, you've, you've heard this story from Tim over and over again. It also gives you temporal resolution. Uh, and again, this is, this is as important for, for uh, air quality as it is for severe storms and weather. This is an example, again, showing the OMI NO2 distribution from a, a long-term record. You can see the individual cities. Um, and now zooming in on uh, Houston, if we look at a time series, this is from a three-day time series, uh, two-day, June 22nd through June 23rd, 2005. And you can see that when only sampling is actually at a minimum of the, both the column and the surface NO2 distribution. So we have no idea about the diurnal variation of this. Temple will give us that for the, for the first time. So the other primary species that Temple will be measuring in a, in a new uh, way is ozone. And there's been a lot of work within the GeoCape uh, science team in looking at how you can combine uh, UV uh, visible and, and near IR uh, radiances to do better retrievals of tropospheric ozone. And kind of the, the holy grail here is getting information about ozone in the boundary layer because that's where people live, and that's the ozone that's being regulated by, by the EPA. So this is, a, <clears throat> this is some figures. So these are showing, as a function of pressure, uh, the averaging kernel um, normalized to uh, one kilometer uh, depth for various different, uh, each one would, would represent a peak at a different, uh, a particular wavelength with a peak at a different pressure. And you see that if we are only considering UV wavelengths, uh, we really don't have very much sensitivity uh, below, um, below 500 millibars at all. Whereas if we add UV and visible wavelengths, we now are able to capture uh, variations within the boundary layer uh, significantly better. And in fact, uh, Peter Zuthman at Harvard has conducted um, Earth uh, system simulation experiments to try and explore uh, in various instrument designs about combining UV and VIS. And uh, so he was able to generate synthetic uh, UV vis uh, radiances, feed those into a, a data assimilation system, and was able to demonstrate that uh, when you compared the prediction with surface ozone, again within this OSI framework, that uh, UV alone had RMS errors in terms of mixing.
purchasing ratio of parts per million that are on the order of seven or so. These are for a high sensitivity and low sensitivity thermal environment. Uh, whereas if you combine uh, UV and Viz, you reduce those errors significantly. And in fact, you reduce them almost as much as you reduce the errors with UV Viz plus uh, thermal IR channel. And so uh, Tempo, again, will have this combination of both UV and visible hyperspectral wavelengths and will allow uh, significant improvements in tropospheric ozone retrievals. So this is the this is this, the makeup of the team. Again, uh, Kelly Chance at the Harvard Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory is the mission, the PI. Um, the project is it's being managed out of NASA Langley. Um, Dave Flintner is leading that effort. Okay, and then the science team is over here. Uh, the instrument's being built by Ball. And here's the science team. Uh, I'm down here uh, under air quality modeling and data assimilation, but it is a big team. And what we'll be doing here at SIMS, uh, as part of the Temple Science Team, is using our uh, real-time air quality uh, modeling system, as well as Wharf Kev, uh, to do chemical data assimilation studies using these new measurements. And as I've said, uh, the advantage is spatially and spectrally, spatially and temporally for ozone and, C and uh, uh, N2O, NO2 will be the most significant ones that I think we'll see. Um, kind of wrapping things up, again, this aligns very closely with the, uh, the decadal survey. Uh, it addresses at least a significant part of the atmosphere part of the GeoCape mission, um, in particular the UV component of that. And if this were to be combined uh, with, a, with a geostation RR instrument, then you would satisfy all of GeoCape. So the reason that this fits in very nicely, particularly with the launch time, is that this allows us now to start being part of a constellation of geostationary uh, measurements that we'll be making air quality measurements over both uh, Europe, uh, North America now, and then also Asia. And this is kind of the timeline for that. At this point, this is a GeoCape uh, slide. NASA was launching GeoCape tentatively 2010, 2020, if it, if it flies at all. And that's outside the uh, the, the schedule for these other instruments. Now with Tempo, we're aligned very nicely with, with these other instruments. We will have this constellation. And kind of to close, what we need now, again, is a, a U.S. geostationary IR sensor uh, that would complete this integrated global observing system. And I'll put a plug in for some activities that, uh, that I know Hank certainly is, is, is involved in. And this is the storm project. And I'll stop right there.
additional data assimilation capabilities. So, you know, I, I think we'll, a lot of the proxy work we've been doing with uh, Gozar API, we can transition some of that to Temple and begin helping Kelly develop algorithms and things like that. Um, so we'll see where that goes. Will that data be coming into our building in some way? Do you I guess else? if, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it would probably be available if, the, if people want to get in. It's going to be delivered in real time through NASA. Other questions? Wait, it's right back here. All right, so. Uh